If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. If you have a piece of paper or a little marker, you might want to stick that in there because we will look at a few verses along the way and then we will come back to Acts chapter 23 later in the message. In Acts chapter 23, and Paul is standing in front of a bunch of his accusers. And um, in verse 1 of Acts chapter 23, Paul says this, or the Lord says this, and Paul earnestly beholding the council said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest who couldn't stand the, the ground Paul walked on commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. For sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then Paul, then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, and what you have to remember about those two groups that were religiously leading the people was, that the Sadducees did not believe in any afterlife. They did not believe in angels. They didn't believe in the spirit world. And so, you know, both of these groups were united when it suited them. And it suited them up until this moment to be against Paul. But Paul looks out and he sees, okay, there's, we've got a mixed group here, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. So look what happens. Verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee of the hope and resurrection of the dead. I am called in question. Man, when he said those words, he polarized that crowd because he capitalized in that moment on the thing where the Sadducees and the Pharisees, where they did not get along. Verse seven. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, a Roman, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So I want to draw your attention to verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your book. We thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that we can be together in your house. And Lord, we ask that you'd please bless your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In Acts chapter 23, Paul is standing in front of this group. But the whole incident, this, this chapter 23, this is the continuation of a story that starts in Acts chapter 21. So let's turn back just a page or two to Acts 21. In Acts chapter 21, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass that after we were gotten from them and had launched, we came with a straight course unto Coos, and the day following unto Rhodes, and from thence unto Patara, 
And finding a ship sailing over into Phoenicia, we went aboard and set forth. And so what's going on here? Paul leaves Ephesus and he winds up in verse eight. He's, he's He lands in Caesarea. OK, so jump to verse 10, verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him. that We begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. So what was Paul's reaction to this? Verse 13. Then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, The will of the Lord be done. Jump down to verse 17. In the next several verses, you're going to see something. And, and what you're going to see is that, that what God said was going to happen, it just played out exactly like God said. Look at verse 17. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when we had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it, therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify themselves with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. So what they've just done here, they, you know, Paul's arrived in Jerusalem and, uh, and you know, the disciples are, are a bit concerned, the, the guys in Jerusalem. They said, wow. So, you know, Paul tells them everything that's been done among the Gentiles and they're rejoicing. And they said, um, Paul, we have a problem. They said, you know, you know, last time you were in town, you know, you had to run for your life. And and uh, man, they, they, they've been, you know, you know, they're in their heart. They wanted to kill you more than once now. And they're going to hear that you're in town. And he said, the problem is, he said, there's thousands of Jews here. And they they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but they're still honoring the customs that were handed down to us from Moses. And as Jews, you know, we still honor that. And they said, so. Um, so why don't you do this, Paul, as, as if this was going to totally solve the problem? And that's the way they present this to Paul. They said, Paul, you know, uh, why don't you uh, why don't you come into the temple with us? And uh, we've got four guys that have a vow. And, of course, that goes back into the Old Testament. You had a vow for so long. And especially if it was like the vow of a Nazarite, usually that was for, you know, it might be for three months or six months or a year. And during that time, the, the Nazarites would let their hair grow. And it was just a symbol that they had totally dedicated themselves to the Lord. But that was always a temporary thing. And when the vow was completed, they, they didn't just go to the barber. They shaved their heads. And they said, Paul, why don't you why don't you come on in with this the temple? We've got four guys here that need to need to get their head shaved. Their their vow is fulfilled. And if you go in there with them and you get your head shaved, too, all these Jews will see you and they'll think, oh, we were wrong. And that'll fix that. So let's see what happened. Verse 26. 
Then Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishing of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, when they saw him, finally they spotted him. They thought, oh, my word, this is Paul. When they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place and further brought Greeks also into this temple, which was forbidden and have polluted this holy place. For they had seen before with him in the city, Trophimus and Ephesians, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was moved. And the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band. The, you know, the Romans in charge of the peace of the city, the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And that's where this, this whole story launches. In, in chapter two, Paul makes another uh, uh, defense before the people. And um, so here's, here's where this whole thing takes off. In Acts chapter 21, Paul leaves Ephesus and he goes to Caesarea and a man named Agabus a prophet of the Lord says, thus saith the Holy Ghost, don't go to Jerusalem or they're going to bind you there. And what God said, man, it happened just like God said it. Paul was not immune from what happens when you ignore the Holy Ghost. And what happened? How did this play out? Four years of captivity followed. Four years of isolation. This was not God's plan for Paul. Paul made a big whopping mistake here. And it was very costly. I mean, anything that costs you four years of your life, that's a pretty big mistake. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Again, keep your place in Acts 23. And I want you to read with me in Romans 8 a very, very familiar verse. You know who Paul was? Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul's the guy that wrote 13 books in the New Testament. Paul was just, uh, man, he was God. The reason you're sitting here this morning is because of the Apostle Paul. That's why you're here this morning. You know, by anybody's standard, he was one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. But wow, did he ever make a mistake? Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 28. Romans 8, verse 28. Very famous verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Who do all things work together for good for? Is that just a blanket statement for every Christian? I don't think so. It says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And this morning, I want to talk to the folks in this room that love the Lord. I mean, I'll, I'll be talking to everybody, but, I'm, but I want to talk to the folks that love God. Look at 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. We got a lot of people in this room that love the Lord.
Look at 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. And anathema means doomed to destruction. And maranatha means at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you some verses. You don't have to turn there. In the book of James chapter 1, you find this verse. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. In James 2, James said, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? First John 4, it says, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In 1 John 5, verse 3, it says, for this is the love of God. How, how would you define it? How would you define it? He said, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. In John 14, Jesus said, and when Jesus said these words, he wasn't looking at lost people. He was looking at his disciples. He said, if you love me. He said, if you love me. Remember what, you know, uh, the Lord asked Peter there right at that, right at the tail end, just before our Lord ascended. The Lord had that conversation with Peter. And three times the Lord asked Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? Peter, do you love me? Jesus said, if you love me, if, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, you know, there's there's a couple different types of love. There is the love of obligation. There's the love of duty. You know, there's some people that you love and um, you know why you love them. Um, you uh, you love them because it's it's your obligation to love them. There is the love of man. It's your duty. Um, you know, you've got family members that, you know, when you when you see them, you don't you, you don't necessarily overflow with warm affection and and just feel thrilled to be with them and yet and yet there's a connection there and there's a there's that blood connection and there's there is a love there is is it a love of enjoyment no not really but it is a love of obligation you know well you know that, that's my brother well you know that's my cousin that's that's my uncle you know and there is a love there and it's not a love of delight but it is a love of obligation but there's another kind of love, and that's the love of gladness. That's the love that says, man, I like this person. I love being around him. I like, I like everything about him. I want to please this person. I want to do something for this person. It's the love of gladness. You know, uh, David said, serve the Lord with gladness. You know, the Lord wants you to love him with a love of gladness, not with a love of obligation. You know, some people, you know, they they probably love the Lord and, and they uh, but their love is more it's it's more of a, a duty thing. Um, but you know what the Lord said when he in there in that chapter in uh, where he's talking about giving there in in Corinthians, he said, uh, uh, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful gift. You know, the, the Lord doesn't want what you do or what I do because. We, we have to do it. He's really not interested in that. He wants it to be done gladly. The love of gladness. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. The acid test of where you stand with God, and, and even, even in the face of judgment someday, Maranatha, that's at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where you stand with him is not really, it's not based necessarily on your profession. 
You know, a lot of people say a lot of things. Matthew 7, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that. And they'll have quite a quite a string of things that they can tell the Lord they did. But but that won't get him in the door. You know, uh, when I was in Sunday school, you know, my you know, my Sunday school teacher, you know, she she prayed with me and and um, that's good. But I hope it's a lot more than just profession. Oh, you know, I, I prayed when I was a little boy beside my bed. OK, you know, well, that's good. But I sure hope it's more than that. Oh, you know, I, I went forward in church, you know, and somebody talked to me and and um, the acid test when you stand in front of the Lord, you know, that you're going to die. And it's not really going to be this way, but you die. And in that moment, wherever you're going to be will be definite in a heartbeat. There's no intermediate state. There's no waiting place. Paul said for to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Duncan, when he breathed his last breath last Friday morning. Of course, I was standing there talking to him and he was struggling to breathe. And she said, all of a sudden, he just breathed. He just stopped. Man, it was done. You know where he was in that moment? To be absent from the body. That There was a moment there where his spirit left his body. And, and to be absent from the body should be present with the Lord. But by the same token, for, for the, the dead that are lost in Luke 16, when that rich man died and he died without Jesus Christ, it says he died and in hell he lift up his eyes. There was no intervening time. It was, it was a sudden thing. You know, uh, when you when you die, it's it's not going to be like this, you know, where you know you 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 stand at the gate and Peter looks over or Gabriel looks over and and says, Why should I let you in? But but if it was that way, you know what's not going to get you in by itself is your profession. You know, well, well, you know, I, I did this and, and I said this and, and I, the acid test, the acid test, your, your profession is part of it, but you bet that's not the acid test. The acid test is not the warmth you feel when people are singing hymns and, uh, and, and a moving service or a moving testimony is underway and, and, you know, and, and somebody tells a moving story and, and it, you know, and you just, just, oh, I just, I didn't. I hope I hope you do feel. Boy, there's some people they don't feel nothing. But I hope you feel. But the acid test is not the warmth that you feel. The acid test is not doctrinal perfection. Man, we live in a day when people believe the the strangest, craziest stuff. And sometimes it's it's a mixture. I mean, they believe five or six things that are really good, and then they believe two things that are just way out there in left field that are just a disaster in the making. And our Christianity is filled with that. Um, but there are people that could say, well, you know, you know, I've, I've researched it and I've, I, I know and, and, and I believe the right thing. And they do believe the right thing. But when you stand in front of God, the acid test will not be doctrinal perfection. The acid test will not be church work. Oh, I did this and I did that and I helped with this and I helped with that. The acid test will not be miracles or angelic visits, or spiritual experiences. We say this stuff, and, and most of you in your room would nod your head in agreement, and yet I just, I'm flabbergasted by the people that have no Bible experience of Jesus Christ. Absolutely zero. They, they never realized they were a sinner. They were never troubled at the judgment of God that they deserved, which leads you to the appreciation of what Jesus Christ did for you, which leads you to open your heart and embrace him. They don't have any story like that, even remotely. And yet they, uh, they go to church. They might even go to a good church, but they saw a light. They were in some troubling circumstance and it was late at night and they might have even been crying out to God. Now you listen to me. They were vulnerable, they were low, they were desperate, and they called out and they saw a light. And you know what they'll tell you after that? They'll say, I, 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 you could go up there, are you saved? Oh, oh yeah, yeah I, I know the Lord. Oh, well, how do you know the Lord? And you're waiting to hear the story of how they embraced the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's not the story that you hear. You hear they were in this desperate strength. And wow, one night they just saw a light and they just had such peace. 
I'm telling you, if you're in this room and that is your situation, I love you and God loves you, but you are lost, lost, lost. The devil is the greatest counterfeiter and the greatest deceiver of all time. And our problem is that pride in us that we felt something. And so now we think we can bypass Jesus Christ. You can't bypass him. And the devil, he'll give you a wonderful feeling. You know, I was I was sick. and I had a guy tell me this one day. I said, do you know the Lord? He said, yeah. I said, tell me about it. He said, you know, I was a little boy and I was sick in my bed and, and I saw Jesus at the end of my bed. So I was waiting for the rest of the story. There was no more to the story. Did he see Jesus? No. He saw something. He saw just enough to make him satisfied, not to embrace the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He embraced his feeling. He embraced that hallucinatory illusion. The acid test, the acid test will not be. You say to some people, yes, yeah, some people, God does supernatural things. Absolutely. But the acid test, the acid test is this. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him be anathema, Maranatha. And this love for the Lord Jesus is visible. Look at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. First Corinthians eight. Look at verse three. First Corinthians eight, verse three. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. You know, we were at that funeral yesterday and and you just couldn't walk away from that funeral. There was one thing that was known about Duncan White. And that is he loved the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, there were witnesses left, right, and center. And if any man loved the Lord, if you love the Lord, no matter who you are, no matter how old, how young, how insignificant, it doesn't matter. If you love the Lord, somebody around you is going to figure it out. And we love him because he first loved us. Paul loved the Lord Jesus Christ. There was no question about that. But folks that love the Lord can make some really wrong decisions. Folks that love the Lord can really make some wrong judgment calls. And there is a difference between being wrong and being false. You know, we're, we're all wrong from time to time. We are. Um, you know, there's times where we're mistaken. There's some times where we think we're doing the right thing. It turns out we weren't doing the right thing. There's a big difference between that and being false, willfully, deliberately doing evil. Um, some people know what they're doing is wrong, but they're just going to do it anyway. There's a big difference. There is a difference in mistakes. You know, uh, lost people make mistakes. And, you know, all of us were there. Um, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And depending on when you got saved, hopefully you got saved as a child and didn't make a bunch of big, bad mistakes. But um, but if you didn't have that blessing, um, you know, as a lost person, you just make a lot of mistakes. And, you know, one of the differences between the lost person that makes mistakes and the person that loves God and makes mistakes. You know what the difference is? When that lost person makes those mistakes, there is no intervention of God. There is no overriding saving purpose. There's no guiding hand in that life. In Acts chapter 12, you know, Peter gets uh, thrown in prison because, you know, the, the king has, has cut off uh, James's head, and, and that really thrilled the Jews. So he decided that he would throw Peter in prison and Peter would be next. So Peter gets thrown in prison 
And he's a little worried that, you know, somebody's going to rescue Peter. So he puts 16 guards, uh, you know, around, around Peter. And I mean, he's, he's chained to these guys and it's, he's in a situation. It's almost impossible to escape. You know, the church there in Acts chapter 12, they had just lost one of their great leaders that they loved. James had just been beheaded. So you know what they do? They, they started praying. I mean, they started praying round the clock. They're praying, 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 praying. And the Bible says that God sent an angel. And that angel comes in and a bright light shining in the prison. But God had caused a deep sleep to fall on those guards. And the angel comes in. Boy, you talk about the peace of God. Peter knows, hey, praise the Lord. I'm saved. I love the Lord. If this is the, my last night on earth, I know where I'm going. And he is snoozing. He is snoozing so soundly, it said the angel smote him on the side. The angel had to smack him <laughs> to wake him up. I'm sure the angel said, Peter. Peter. Whack. <laughs> and Peter wakes up. And Peter stands up and his chains fall off. And the door opens and the angels walking with him out through the gate. And the Bible says the guards never woke up. And the Bible says Peter thought he was having a dream. Sounds like a sweet dream. He, say, he thinks I'm having a dream. And he gets out to the gate of the city and the gate of the city opens up all by itself. And then the angel said, see you later. And he disappears. And, um, and Peter goes back to the house where everybody's praying. And man, they are thrilled out of their mind. But that was Peter. See, the Lord is working on Peter's behalf because Peter loves the Lord. You know who God didn't work for? Those 16 soldiers. The next morning, where's the prisoner? And they take those 16 soldiers. They start questioning, how did he get out? What's going on? Because the gate, the door, that prison door is still Locked. How'd he get out? You know what? You know what Herod did with those 16 soldiers? What they always did when a soldier escaped, they killed those 16 guys. No intervention from God. You know why? They're on the wrong side. Boy, there's a difference in mistakes. There's a difference in the way God deals with the lost and the people that love him. When somebody loves the Lord, now please hear me. It's 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 the love, it's the love of gladness. I it, it's not perfect. You know, you know, you know, you all you married couples in here, you you love your husband, you love your wife, and and you know, um, from day one, you know, you are crazy about each other and all that stuff, but that doesn't mis mean that you know you never made a mistake, you know, it wasn't perfect, and it has never been perfect, and it never will be perfect. But there is a love of gladness. And our love for the Lord Jesus is, is not perfect. It's a work in progress. But the Lord looks down and when he sees someone that wants to please him, it's not the love of obligation. It's somebody that wants to please him. You know what he does? Oh, he works on their behalf. He's speaking to them. He's directing them. He's overturning things. He moves heaven and earth for them. Boy, David wasn't perfect, but David said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? There are some Christian folks that continually make serious mistakes. Um, sometimes it's from a lack of discernment. Sometimes they just don't ask for the wisdom that God said he would give. Sometimes it's their pride or stubbornness. Sometimes it's because they refuse just to do the really simple, obvious things. Sometimes it's because they're not honest with themselves. But, you know, even if you're one of those Christians that you, you really love the Lord and you're, you're really, you really love him and you're, you're trying to avoid all those mistakes. I heard an old man say many years ago something that really helped me. He said, you know, once in a while you'll be seeking the Lord and you will make a mistake. He said, if you were genuinely seeking to know and do his will, he said, you know what God will do? He'll cover your tracks. 
That's what God does for the people who love him. I know a bunch of you in here, you love the Lord this morning. I got good news for you this morning. Boy, don't you wish we could never make a mistake? I look back and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, we always, <laughs> there's a lot of things we don't talk about, you know, and we, we don't usually go around talking about our horrible mistakes. And uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say, praise the Lord, you know, my, my mistakes are all behind me, but you know as well as I do, that's probably not true. You know, we're probably going to make another one or two yet. And if you love the Lord, I got good news for you this morning. The Lord is going to work on your behalf. He is involved. You know, Paul did not make many blunders. Most of the time, Paul was right. And that can be a really dangerous place. There are some of you in this room. There's some of you that you, you, your husband, your wife, they'd say, you know what? My husband's like that. My wife is like that. My dad's like that. You know, my mom, you know what? They, it's pretty amazing. They, they're, they're right most of the time. Paul was right 99% of the time. But boy, sometimes your great strength can be your pitfall. And Paul makes a mistake here. Paul made that mistake in his zeal. And in his love for his family, you know, in Romans nine, you know what he called the Jews? He called them my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul made that mistake in his fearlessness, in his in his anticipation of heaven. You remember in Acts 14, Paul had already had one trip to heaven under his belt. And, you know, Paul really was not afraid of, you know, uh, he just, he wasn't afraid of that, the chains. He wasn't afraid of that. Paul made a mistake because he didn't really think about the cost of making this mistake. Paul made a mistake in his confidence of his own judgment. Agabus was right. That prophet, Agabus, and then the people in that room that began to plead with him, they were right. But you know what? He had his fingers in his ears. He couldn't hear him. Paul makes a mistake in the goodness of his service. What's he doing? Is, is, he, is he selling windows? Bless God, I'll go there and if they kill me for selling windows, we'd go, oh, that's stupid. Yeah, it would be stupid. You know what he's doing? He's preaching. He's preaching. He's trying to win the lost. He's trying to help believers. He wants to turn people from darkness to light. And that's what God said he would do. He's doing the best thing that could be done. But in the midst of doing the best thing that could be done, he didn't listen to what the Holy Ghost was telling him. And what does God do? You know, just being a great Christian, I hope you're all great Christians, but just being a great Christian, does it make you immune? It does not. What does God do? God lets him be trapped. And God shows him that he was right. Look at Acts 21 for a moment. Acts 21. <clears throat> so here's what happens. You know, Paul gets grabbed, you know, there in Jerusalem and, and the soldiers come down and rescue him. So now... They've uh, they've got him. Um, they they've got him up on the uh, the castle stairs, and Paul and I mean you remember the picture. The whole city is in an uproar right now. I mean they have all converged on this guy that they hate. So the soldiers grab him. The crowd's still there. The crowd is still screaming, and the soldiers get Paul. And they start taking him up the castle stairs. And Paul gets to the top of the stairs and he says, 
he, he suddenly looks at the soldier and he speaks Greek, which shocked the soldier. And he says, um, can you let me address the crowd for a minute? And the soldier goes, okay. So Saul does this with his hands. He says he beckoned to them and all of a sudden, thousands and thousands and thousands of people go silent. And Paul begins to preach to that crowd. Look at it. Verse 40. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand to the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue. And chapter 2, man, he starts, he starts uh, preaching to them and giving him his testimony. And you know, right at that moment, Paul is in his glory. Paul is is doing the thing that is the closest to his heart. He's trying, He said, I could wish that I was a curse for my brethren according to the flesh. Man, he's preaching to them. Thousands, maybe the biggest Jewish crowd he'd ever had in his whole life. And uh, he's going, he go, man, it's glorious. Look at verse 14 of chapter 22. Chapter 22, verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what he has seen and heard. Paul's telling the Jews his testimony. And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass that when I was, in, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance and saw him saying unto me. And this is this is almost ironic. He's relaying to that crowd his experience. And, and, and I wonder if all of a sudden he thought, what, what am I saying right now? Look at these next words. Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem. For they will not receive that testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Now watch. And he said unto me, the Lord said to Paul, depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Now verse 22. And they gave him audience until this word. And then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Man, all of a sudden, that crowd goes ballistic, and they want him dead. You know what? You know what the Lord does? Um, he lets Paul feel his mistake. Paul said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And God says, Paul, you're wasting your time. They are not going to listen. So Paul goes anyway. And you know what God does? He lets him be trapped. God shows him that he was right, that God was right. And he lets him feel his mistake. You know, sometimes the Lord does that. Sometimes you're going to make a mistake. And you know what the Lord does? It, it just be so nice. The Lord forgives our sins instantly. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And man, that's instant. But boy, you know, as well as I do, uh, sometimes there's just some mistakes. You're, you're going to feel them for a while. Now, I don't think there's anybody in this room like this. and Maybe this is a poor example, but it's a, it's a legit example. Let's say, uh, let's say, you know, you're, you're looking for a house. You're trying to buy this house. And, and uh, all of a sudden this house turns up and, um, and man, uh, you know, you're, you're just, you love this house. You love the property, but, but you know, you just don't quite have enough and you're just not quite going to, you know, uh, qualify for the mortgage, but then there's this back door sort of underhanded way that opens up to sort of, you know, the, the lawyer says, oh, I'll loan you a little extra money. And, and, uh, and you're just thinking, oh yes, I can make this work. And, but something in your heart's going, don't do this. Don't do this. And you know what? You're just happy about this house and your wife's happy about this house and the kids are happy about this house. And you're going, oh, well, you know, God wouldn't let it work out if it wasn't his will. Right? You know, Jonah had the money for the boat, but it was the wrong boat. And so all of a sudden, you sign that dotted line, that house is yours. Man, you get about two months in, 
everything under the sun's going wrong with that house. And, and, uh, you know, and you lose your job, which God knew was going to happen beforehand. And that was why the Holy ghost was saying, don't do this. And all hell breaks loose. And one night you get on your knees and you say, God, I was wrong. I never should have done this. God, forgive me. How long does it take before he forgives you? Oh, he forgives you. You're forgiven. But you're going to be riding on that mistake for a while. You're going to feel that one. You'll think twice before you pull that one again. Paul loved the Lord. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. God doesn't cause everything. You know, Joseph was betrayed by his brethren. God didn't cause their sin. God didn't cause Paul to ignore the Holy Ghost. But God can overrule and make things work together for good. And so here's what happens. All of a sudden, you wind up in Acts 23, where we started. And look at verse 11. Man, Paul's in this mess. He is really eyeball deep in a mess now. And he's going to be riding out this mistake for a few years to come. But isn't God good? You know what God does? Acts 23, verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. Aren't you glad Paul's not like some of your relatives who would just ride you and smack you down, always remind you of your stupidity? Would say, yeah, I told you so. You know, God didn't say, Paul, I told you so. He said, Paul, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. He said, Paul, you dropped the ball. But you love me and I love you and we're going we're gonna to work this out. Be of good cheer. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. The Lord speaks to comfort and reassure his people. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. God is greater than our mistakes. And the Lord, what does the Lord do in this verse? It's crazy. You know what the Lord the Lord encourages him to rejoice. Be a good cheer, Paul. We sang this morning. Come, Christians, join to sing. The Lord encourages him to rejoice. Why? Because the Lord will yet bring him to the right place. You know why? Because Paul loves the Lord. Paul loves the Lord. I got good news for you. If you love the Lord, uh, the Lord knows that. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to bend heaven and earth to help you, even, even in our mistakes. In Psalm 145, you find some precious words. It says, the Lord preserveth all them that love him. He preserves them. Look at Acts 23. We're almost done. So Paul has dropped the ball. Paul has done what God told him not to do. And Paul's going to ride this one out, but the Lord's going to ride it out with him. The Lord's going to overturn some things. He's still going to wind up at the right place. But look what the Lord does. The Lord preserves all them that love him. That's what it says. The Lord doesn't preserve everybody. He preserves them that love him. Now watch what happens right after God speaks to Paul in this verse 11, Acts 23, 11. Look at verse 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, therefore, ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. He, would, he was a little boy, okay? And you'll, you'll see that in a minute. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. 
So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand. He was a little boy, took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is that thou hast to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire something of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them. For there lie in wait for him of them more than 40 men, which have bound themselves with an oath, that thy will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a sign from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, saying, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen threescore and ten, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. Now watch. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. The Lord preserveth. Oh, you know what Paul deserved? Paul deserved to have his head whacked off. The Lord could have said, Paul, you idiot. I told you. Well, they're going to kill you. Well, you know, you made your bed. Lie in it. And you know, God does that with some people. He really does. But not if you love him. The Lord preserveth all them that love him. And it was Paul that wrote later on, just before his death, Many years later, he wrote, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul loved the Lord. So you that love the Lord here this morning, this is for you. It's for us. You know what? Mistakes are costly. We could, A bunch of us, boy, we could tell stories, couldn't we? Mistakes are costly. It would really pay us to live by Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But if you have blundered, you're in good company. And the Lord is not done with you. And he knoweth your frame. And you know where the Lord is? He's where, he's where he was with Paul. He's not far away. And he is standing by to encourage you. You know why? Because you love him. Well, I'm telling you, there is a reason. A good reason to love the Lord. Happy are the people that love the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, someday all that will matter will be that we loved you. Lord, in Jesus' name. Maybe there's somebody in this room, they really need to understand that. They really need to understand that they really need to love thee, Lord. It's, it's bigger than their experience and their profession and their all that stuff, Lord. God, in Jesus' name, please help, Lord. And Lord, help your people today. God, may we love thee with that love of gladness. And I, I pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would encourage. Lord, maybe there's somebody in the room today. And Lord, they're, they're living in the shadow. Lord, they love you, but they're living in the shadow of some mistake they made. Lord, may they realize this morning that you have not forgotten them. And that you are with them. And you will preserve them. And you'll get them to the right place. And Lord, even now you are standing by. God, may your people be encouraged in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano plays, why don't you talk to the Lord?
Lord, bless your word to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.